Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order this Committee of the Whole meeting of the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores and welcome everybody to the Council Chambers this evening. We're glad you're here. The uh, first item uh, is disclosure of pecuniary interest. I'll ask any member if they have a pecuniary interest with anything on the agenda that they would like to declare. Being none, of course, you can declare any time if you need to. Uh, there are no additions, deletions, or amendments that I'm aware of. Uh, so that takes us to item four, which is delegations. And we have one delegation on this evening, and it's from Phil Sheriff. Uh, and he's here to speak to us about the proposed sale of town trailer parks. So uh, welcome, Phil. And if you just uh, push the, uh, the purple button up there, you'll, you'll get your mic on. Good evening. Thank you for uh, allowing me to, uh, to speak with you this evening um, concerning the uh, reported proposal to uh, sell the, uh, the tourist camps in Southampton and Port Elgin. Um, as an introduction, my name is uh, Phil Sheriff. My family has been visiting Southampton since 1962. We would load up the car, spend a half a day driving up from Hamilton for my father's two weeks holidays with a big tent arrive in Southampton, pitch the tent, and spend two lovely weeks at the beach and enjoying the town. We progressed over those years um, from 10 holidays to uh, trailers, had a total of six different trailers. We currently have a uh, park model 12 by 40 foot trailer in Camp 3 at Southampton. Um, over the time growing up here as a kid, I uh, did it all. I learned to swim, set pins in the old bowling alley, Learned to fish and water ski, had a great time, made a lot of good friends who uh, still very good friends. The park is very generational. The family immediately behind our trailer, Kathy and I grew up together. Our grandchildren now join us at the park every summer. Uh, in addition, I also have a cottage property. So I do have a vested interest in the management of the, the town and how things are going. Um, we have a, a small cottage which we use with our, our, our children, grown children and grandchildren now use. And, um, you know, we've had many, many great times here. Um, the subject of selling the park um, has been broached many, many times. I'm sure you're all aware of that. <clears throat> and um, I'd just like to voice a few considerations that, uh, that I feel um, might shed some light, a, a different viewpoint. Uh, I understand there were recent comments um, made by an individual during an unsolicited presentation to the uh, town council. The points here were received, listed here, were received uh, anecdotal nature uh, from a variety of sources. So if there is any inaccuracies, it's unintentional. Basically, I'm going on you know, what I heard at the, over the course of time. And I'll just refer to these as reported points to justify or to motivate the proposed sale of the town-owned parks. Uh, reportedly, the previous presenter talked about the number of building lots the town could use and develop, to get development charges, property taxes that would be generated through the sale of the parks, and uh, also uh, discussed what the town spends on utilities, which uh, were reported as being free to the park tenants. And uh, another comment that he doubts that the camp residents actually contribute much to the local economy. He did acknowledge that uh, there's a sizable profit from the parks in the neighborhood, uh, I heard, of 525,000, which we'll talk about shortly. So to address these points, I'll do them in an orderly fashion. Regarding building lots and the revenue potential with the conversion from the recreational zoning that the properties currently have to residential, um, I've put some numbers together. I think you've seen them. Uh, these are estimated ballpark numbers. You could nitpick them by all means, but they're portraying something very close to what the reality would be, I think. The trailer sites are 30 by 50 feet. Typical building lot call it 60 by 100, um, which would allow for road allowances and setbacks, that type of thing. And uh, it also makes for easy math. I'm big on easy math. Gives you a ratio of four trailer sites to one building site. 
Revenue coming into the town, trailer sites currently rent for approximately $2,500 for the season. Four, building, four trailer sites would therefore generate $10,000 revenue to the town, less expenses. A completed cottage property, call it $4,000 municipal tax, um, times one property. About 25% of that tax, uh, property tax, actually finds its way back to the municipalities in Ontario. Uh, fully 50% goes to the Ministry of Education. Another 25% approximately goes to the province for uh, infrastructure and supporting that great bureaucracy in Toronto. In addition, the trailer owners also pay property tax. On a trailer like ours, a 40 by 12 foot park model, it's assessed and we pay approximately $450 per annum property tax. So the town gets another $112.50 approximately in revenue times four, so there's $450 good revenue coming into the town. So if you summarize it and compare the numbers, four trailer sites generates approximately $10,450 direct revenue to the town. A cottage would generate about $1,000 in property taxes to the town. Um, <clears throat> in regard to the free utilities, utilities are built into the rent. Like any rental property, whether you're renting a house to two people or you have an apartment building, the utilities are paid for by the landlord in most cases, and that's an inclusive, inclusive part of the, uh, the cost of the, uh, the, the building or the facility. Three years ago, there was a proposal actively discussed about installing electrical meters at each site. Um, cost benefit. To do that was, um, my understanding was it was prohibitive and there was also the legal issue of uh, the town of Saugeen Shores parks becoming a distributor of electricity which uh, is an illegal issue within the uh, electrical uh, legislation, distribution legislation in the province. So that was scrapped in favor of the simple, here again I like the simple part, take the dollars for electrical utilities, water, just build them into the price of the rental, annual rental, and it's you pay an invoice, the town pays an invoice, and things are very straightforward. You don't have to have people reading meters or doing any of that type of thing. Apparently, the tenants in the parks don't contribute much to the merchants in the town. Well, marketing 101 for any retail business is what size market can my business draw from? Here again, we'll use the example, four trailer sites versus one cottage site. What merchant would support a reduction in their available households from four to one? It just doesn't make sense. Everyone in the trailer parks have to eat, they have to buy clothing, the, the you know, beverages, drinks, repair their stuff, go to movies, take the kids to the museum on rainy days, go to the flea markets down at Port Elgin, go on the steam train. These people are all doing that and all enjoying it. You know, we've had our grandchildren, grandson down at the, the train this, this summer. All these people are enjoying that. Four to one. It's a huge market change. And I would be really surprised if any merchant in these, this town would... Uh, would stand up and say, yeah, that makes good sense. Let's reduce it from four to one households. Uh, just don't see it happening. So I got some um, financial reporting from the town regarding the revenue and expenses generated from the park and um, really, really significant numbers. In general, the last three years, the park has generated just over a million dollars in revenue. Um, Expenses are less than 50%, and that includes the utilities, the aforementioned utilities. It includes the staffing, the management, the summer students that service the parks, garbage pickup, that type of thing. The profit on these parks is, is fantastic. This year they're projecting 59.8% profit. I'll tell you, if you can find me a business that I can get 59% profit, I'm there. That's a phenomenal amount of money, and it's a no-brainer. It just 
flows into the town. Last year, the utilities were $175,000. So utilities really represent a very small portion when you take into account the, uh, the, the money spent on labor for the management and the personnel. And um, the projection is that the utilities are actually going down. And that's um, something that's mandated by the people, or not mandated, but happening because of the people in the parks. More conversion to solar lighting, higher efficiency trailers. All the new trailers that come in are all LED lights, um, better insulated, just a better product. As everything in our life these days is improving technologically, the trailers, the RVs, they're all improving as well. And um, efficiency is, uh, is critical. And that's something that's marketed very heavily by the, uh, the RV manufacturers. So, you know, that kind of profit, that kind of revenue is, uh, is really quite incredible for a town. Um, so if you were to sell the properties and uh, generate the revenue from the actual initial sale and the development charges that go with it as the developer applies for permits and rezoning and subdivision uh, applications and all that stuff, yeah, there'd be some good money, definitely. You can't argue that. It's, uh, the property has value. However, unless the town wants to get into the real estate business, the properties would be sold to a developer who are very shrewd. They will get the best price they can for that property, um, the best discount price they can get, and uh, into a price low enough to allow them to develop it and sell it and actually make a profit. So how much will the town get from the sale of the properties? Nobody knows at this point. It's all market driven. So, you know, and you also have to look at the, the zoning on the properties now. They are currently zoned for recreational use. Actually, Camp 3 in Southampton, for the most part, is flood hazard. Not too many people know that, but there's uh, having purchased property and know people who own property in that areas. There is a 100-year storm issue raised by the Saugeen Conservation Authority, that uh, hill coming from 21, Highway 20 on down to the lake. Um, that area will fill with water. So getting a building permit to build a home in there in a lot of places is, uh, is quite tricky. I've talked to the Conservation Authority a few years back for about a property that I thought about buying. It scared me right off. Didn't want to even go near there because of this flood hazard. So in conclusion, first of all, will the province allow the rezoning from recreational to more building lots when the town already has lots of building lots? What is the market for buyers? Who will buy them? This has to be answered. Will the next round of the Bruce Power rebuild do it? Well, who knows? They're not putting money into nuclear right now. It's all going into solar and wind. Um, and if they do a rebuild, that's temporary housing, not permanent housing. The retired community, of which I'm one, we have many good friends in the, in the trailer parks who are retired, they don't want to put a lot of money in because they want to be snowbirds. So they have a budget, some budget for Southampton, some budget for Arizona, South Ham or Florida, wherever. And also they want to be close to their grandchildren, whether that's in Toronto, Hamilton, Kitchener, Cambridge. Um, you know, what would the impact be on the current property uh, development lands where there's, you know, people that have invested in development lands all of a sudden, somebody else comes in and buys more property. It's going to drive the market down. Real estate development is a crapshoot. Make no mistake about it. There's been a lot of people over the years lost money in real estate development. The highly profitable park situation that the town currently has is a sure thing. Money comes in every year. It's like having an uncle that left you an annuity, and that money comes into your bank account every month. It's, it's there, and it's just comes from, you know, it's an automatic thing. Parks provide lots of summer employment for students, you know, and I'm sure there's grant money available from the province and from the federal government for supporting summer students. I know the business I used to be part of, we used to get money from the governments all the time for summer students. We had them coming in all the time. We always said, oh, you got a summer student this year. Oh, what am I going to do with that person when you got a 
keep them occupied. It's always a challenge. The park's a great opportunity for that. And as I said before, four households versus one household, if the property was developed, generates a lot of money for the local merchants. Everyone buys in the parks. Everyone goes shopping. RVs have small fridges. They're not big because they're lightweight, they're portable. They don't have freezers. They got chest freezers. They got little, you know, the little freezer. So you want meat for the barbecue on Saturday? You got to buy it. And uh, you know, when the grandchildren are coming up, you've got to go out and buy the treats for them. So the the merchants, the grocery stores, it would be a big impact. Um, you know, finally, about the short, you know, tourist season here is short. And in my view, the town should be taking great efforts to encourage more tourism, to stimulate the tourism industry by increasing the camping facilities. There's property in Southampton by Camp 3. As I said, it's flood hazard, but you can do it, zone it as recreational. Put more parks in, more campsites in, generate more revenue. Improve the biking, improve the fishing, get the beach conditions up to speed. The Southampton Beach is neglected a lot of the time. Port Elgin gets lots of uh, attention, but the Southampton Beach, basically, if you get a tractor hauling a rake through it every once in a while, that's about it. The town needs to generate more revenue and more business for the business, for the business uh, owners on the main streets. You drive down Port Elgin in the summertime, or Southampton, and the volume of traffic up and down Highway 21 is enormous, right past. Nobody stops. People hauling trailers, boats, cars, they need places to park. They want to be lured to go into those stores and shop, to stop for something to eat. You know, they go to Walmart to some extent because, hey, you can park an RV or a trailer or a boat, whatever. You know, get some buskers out there, get some street vendors, encourage people to stop and shop. That's what keeps the town viable and healthy. So I think it's a good opportunity keep the parks, generate a lot of good money for the town, and a lot of money for the merchants. Um, and like I said, I think they should be, the town should be expanding the park facilities because they are there. A lot of money goes into the marina, adding more slips. Why aren't they adding more campsites? And the uh, town needs more, not less. Anyway, that's my uh, pitch. Thank you for listening, and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Phil. I'll ask members of the committee if they have any uh, comments or questions to the deputy, to the delegation. We'll start with uh, Councillor Dave Mayette. Thank you, Phil. Uh, you, you certainly uh, raised some very uh, interesting points and uh, counterpoints, as, as the case may be, because we did hear from a from a delegation at our open open forum there a few weeks ago, and. Uh, and I really appreciate that. We're going into budget time in the next uh, month or so, and, uh, and these numbers uh, and, and the clarity you've put to them helps to make a little bit of sense to it, and it'll help us to make some hopefully informed decisions for, for the betterment of the community. And uh, I just want to say thank you for, for coming out and voicing your opinions and, you. and for the work that you did. Thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Grace. Um, thanks. Thank you, Phil. Um, I guess what I would like to say... Uh, talking about budget is that, um, if anything, I hope that we look at spending some more on our tourist camps because I think they're a valuable asset and uh, I'd, like us, I'd, I'd, I'd like us to look at, um, you know, better, better maintenance, um, upgrades on some of the bathrooms and things like that. Thank you. Councillor Minaj. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Charbonneau, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate the opportunity to ask you to ask if we're going to be able to ask staff for a complimentary report um, that, that uh, doesn't, that, that agrees or, or refutes some of the points that have been made here. I mean, I know it's going to be difficult to be able to put Phil's information in front of us at budget time and say, well, that's it. So I'd like to see more, more information, and I'd like to be able to cipher it all out. In particular, I've heard you say, Luke, that uh, we shouldn't be in the business of running businesses in the community. 
And so maybe there's an opportunity to find out how much would a tourist camp business sell for on the open market? And what could we do with that money? Let's just say, for example, it was deemed to be worth a million dollars to a, to a business person that looks at our books and sees the profit and says, we'll give you a million dollars. We've got a report tonight, a financial report from Susan that says how much we can invest our money and what return we can get on our money. So we would be out of the staffing issues and we would be looking for, we're looking for new revenue streams. So I'd like to, I'd like to see the Economic Development Committee and possibly our finance department say, here are some other opportunities when we look at this mess of problem we've got. And then I'd like to look at property, and I'd like to look at exactly what Phil has just said. What other properties are out there that we can ensure the zoning is correct and develop more trailer parks, double-wide trailer parks like they do in communities in Florida, and maybe we can, we can arrange for it to be to be better developed and, and look at special planning requirements. I, I heard at the open house for B33 Road and B25 Road that some deal was, was in the offing that said if Bruce County was able to, to get the property they wanted to straighten the road out, that they would allow those residences that they took the property from to be able to develop those properties and they're within walking distance of Goebbels Grove Main Beach. So those opportunities are there too. So somehow I'd like to put this all together and get a clearer picture and deal with it in the next three years. Thank you. Thank you, Council Minaj. I think that the, uh, to your question, I think the ideal time to address the issue um, of our trailer park operations or the operation of any municipal business will be during the budget upcoming. I think that that would be an ideal opportunity to have a detailed discussion about those subjects and uh, ask, for any, ask any questions you might have at that point. Uh, Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. I just think it's important that we make clear that this is not an agenda item yet. Um, this, is, this was a, a, a comment from a member of the public at um, our open forum. and. Uh, that was the point of the open forum, just to let people say, you know, what was on their mind, throw some ideas into the mix, comment, criticize, celebrate, whatever. So this this is not an agenda item. It's my third term on council. Um, this is about the sixth or seventh time I've heard the, the topic come up. So, um, you know, certainly it's it's always always sort of resonating, I guess, at the very back of my mind. But it's 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 not an agenda item yet. It is important, though, um, you know, should it get discussed, there's a, there's a number of factors that, that play into it, revenues versus expenses and potential um, realization of profit, profit, which impacts the tax levy amount, definitely plays a role in that. It's also important, though, that, you know, we keep in mind that we've been getting requests to create bigger lots in the trailer camps, and people want, you know, 50-foot wide lots. Well to accommodate bigger trailers. Those are building lots in this community. That's the size of building lot that we're creating now. So um, there's a number of things that would come into play should the discussion occur. But I just think it's important that we say out loud, it's not an agenda item yet. So I appreciate you being here. Um, and certainly I set pins at the bowling alley and I delivered newspapers and did all the things on your list too. So um, I think you have a great deal in common with quite a few of us. Um, and you know, certainly any kind of decision would, would not happen with a whole lot of discussion and conversation and, and consultation and, and, you know, considering this, considering la that. But um, I don't think um, we should expect that it's, it's going to be, you know, in the next six months. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, good you're here. Um, I would like to hope that more people come out to the open forum, should we choose to have another one again, and I hope we do, because... That's, that's a good place to just generate some conversation about sure. different things going on. But thank you for coming out. Thank you. Are there any further questions or comments from members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you again, Phil. And I think, this, I think it's very important to not put too fine a point on what Vice Deputy Mayor Huber just said. This, yeah. is, this, is, this is not, the, the town of Socking Shores at this point is not considering selling our trailer parks. Um, it's not a discussion that this council's had. I just want to I look over at my friends in the media and make sure, and, and, and <laughs> make sure that they make it clear that that is, that is the case. And, uh, but that's not, um, 
but I think it's uh, good that the discussion uh, is out there, and that's why we held the open session before, and we're glad you came and, and furthered it here for us tonight. So thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, that moves us on then to uh, reports of municipal officers. And ge under general government, we have a staff report uh, from uh, the deputy treasurer, Sue Dent, on investment policy implementation and one fund approval. Sue, take it away. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, our recommendation is uh, that council consider a bylaw to enter into the agency agreement between Chums Financing Corporation and the Local Authority Services Limited. Um, with respect to the one investment program and that council authorize the director of finance to ex execute any necessary documents required to invest available funds of the municipality through both the one investment program and uh, CIBC Wood Gundy in accordance with the approved investment policy. Um, back in May, council considered and adopted the revised investment policy. Um, that allows for investment of available funds um, in a prudent manner to maximize our return and minimize our degree of risk. One of the primary objectives of the policy is to ensure the preservation of capital and the protection of any invested funds over the, the principal over the invested term. Um, in August, we had representatives of both CIBC Wood Gundy and the One Investment Program um, here to make presentations to Council outlining their various investment opportunities. Um, these highlighted opportunities to expand our current investment practice beyond just our bank account. Um, since then, we have continued to research options. We have contacted several other municipalities who use one and or both of these uh, CIBC Wood Gundy and the One Investment Program um, to try and get an understand or understanding from a practical, practical perspective how these have worked for them. Um, <coughs> As identified in the previous report, based on our long-term cash flow projections, the town would have approximately four and a half million dollars available to invest over the next uh, five to ten years. Um, we feel pr it would be prudent to begin cons much more conservatively than that and look at probably investing about two and a half million and diversifying our investments by looking at both of these investment opportunities. Um, in accordance with the policy, of course, though, no principal would be placed at risk throughout this initial investment expansion period. Um, I just want to say here, too, that this is very much just, still just laying the groundwork. We're not actually proposing to make any investments at this time. We're still looking at early 2016 um, before we start actually putting our money into an investment. That would give time for the new director of finance to get uh, involved in this process, um, have some say in, in what we should be doing, what, and allow us also to continue to consult with other municipalities. I had a long conversation this morning with um, another uh, county, actually, that uh, gave us some very good um, information on investments and how they do things. So, um, yes, so just laying the groundwork and... Uh, moving forward to allow us to uh, actually get going on some of this. Great. Thanks, Sue. I'll read the recommendation, then we'll take questions or comments. The recommendation is that Council consider a bylaw to enter into the agency agreement between Chums Financi Financing Corporation and the Local Authority Services Limited as agent and eligible investors with respect to the one investment program and that council authorizes the director of finance treasurer to execute any necessary documents required to invest available funds of the municipality through both the one investment program and the extended range of investment services offered by CIBC Wood Gundy in accordance with the approved investment policy. Questions or comments to the recommendation? Councillor Don Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, through you, is the 1.1% interest rate pretty much common throughout all our different financial institutions, or will the one have a slightly variable rate, or does that depend upon the, the different diversification of our funds? Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, our uh, rate that we're earning on our bank account right now is prime less. Uh, <laughs> I forget what the actual number is, but that brings us to 1.1%. Obviously, as the prime rate changes and it has been going down, that 1.1% will decrease. Um, that is what uh, 
the one investment program is currently offering in their high interest savings account. Um, so that's a fairly um, common rate as far as savings goes right now. Councillor Rich. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Thanks for that, Sue. Um, so I'm looking at 2.5 million versus 4.5 million. Um, when I look at our current funds, it looks like we're losing money um, as compared to inflation. So when I saw the presentation, I didn't see there being a whole lot of risk. Um, so um, my question is, where did you come up with the number 2.5 and, and why wouldn't we want to start right off with 4.5 million? Yeah, the CAO would like to answer that one. Mr. Deputy Mayor, we considered uh, whether or not we should be a little conservative at the beginning to see what the new Liberal government is going to do in terms of infrastructure dollars, and we want to be a little bit more liquid than we might have been a year ago. Councillor Dave Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, on that point, uh, the important part about having reserves, obviously, is to have the money available should the opportunity or the necessity come around to be able to use that money. And I'm assuming that by making an investment in one of the one of the outfits that we're talking about here, to a certain extent, the money is going to be tied up for uh, for a term a term investment of some sort or other. But on the other hand, we've heard before that our our municipality has a significant borrowing capability untapped at this point in time. So. Um, to me, it makes sense to enter into an investment portfolio where we're going to start making some real returns, if not even just keeping up with inflation on the money that we have in reserves. And should the opportunity come along that we could uh, tap into some newfound uh, grant money or, uh, or federal money or, or infrastructure money that comes along, I think we have the capability to, to leverage some borrowing room until such time as we can make those funds available. Is, is that the correct assumption? Okay. Or right. Sue? Uh, Larry? Uh, we don't disagree in principle with what you're saying, but in terms of what we want to do right at the beginning of the year, till we had a sense of what the government is doing, we thought this was the most conservative approach. But, but certainly, yes, I think it was explained to Council when the policy first came forward that if there were investments that were tied up for a period of time, OSIFA and those, and those programs would offer very competitive rates. So if we did have to bridge until something came flexible again, it was possible. Councillor Minaj. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Luke, uh, I guess I'm, I'm going to ask for clarification and then I'm going to challenge this opportunity. So the clarification I would like is to ask it, it goes on to say, I just didn't have time today to call in, I'm sorry, that if we had have been doing this over the past five years through the one investment program, we would have realized $520,000. So that's a, approximately $100,000 a year. So that's one investment. My understanding is that when the two presentations came, the CIBC presentation, they're different, right, than the one investment. The CIBC presentation had, this, had the same risk and more return, at more availability of return. And I understood that at any time we wanted to pull our money, we could pull our money, but we wouldn't get the, maybe get the return. So I'm not seeing the risk as being as risky as, as it's being portrayed. So I would like us to to go to the more aggressive CIBC portfolio package that was, was brought forward. And, and I, I don't know how we're going to have that debate. Maybe it's just me. But I think that we should, we should be going to the more aggressive package that, that, that has a better, better possible return. I understand the argument that's been made by CAO that, that uh, we need to have some, some available money in case some good, some good infrastructure money comes forward. So I'd, one I'd like to, I, I think I would, I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to vote against this because I think that I'd really like to see us go after the CIBC package. And the second thing I'd like to do is say, I don't believe we need to wait for a director of finance to lose $50,000. If, if, if we could have made $500,000 in the last five years, that's $100,000 a year. So if we wait six months, as the recommendation is, we just lost $50,000. So I, 
So if we, if we put this package, we should be able to vote on a package. We should ha ask and direct our treasurer, that Sue is fulfilling that role right now, to execute this this week and get that $50,000 that we w would otherwise lose. And that's another reason I would ask for change to this report. Thank you. Maybe we could ask the CAO to clarify um, the two points. One, uh, um, the thinking of the administration as to why we're going to wait for the uh, treasurer uh, to move, or a new treasurer to move this forward and uh, um, also uh, to provide clarity on uh, Councilman Minaj's other question. Um, did you do that, Larry? Three, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, staff felt that we were only approximately eight weeks from having a new director of finance potentially in place, and given the fact that this has been something that we've been moving to kind of only incrementally for a long period of time, it was valuable to get their potential input. If Council approves the recommendation here tonight, I think what's going to happen is we'll get the documentation in place. We'll have some very specific conversations through Sue as to what the specific vehicles are, and we haven't got to that point yet. There would be a cross-section of potential investments. I think what we're doing here is listening to Council's um, concerns and direction in terms of the degree of risk one wants to take, and that's valuable information that we'll take away from this conversation. By approving the recommendation, I don't think you're precluding the, uh, the CIBC program at all. It just gives us more flexibility to potentially use the one fund as well. Very good. Um, Councilor Grace. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Deputy Mayor, um, or Deputy Mayor, I should say, sorry. Um, I actually um, have concern, like Councilor Minaj, that I am concerned about the specifics of the of where the investment would be going. Um, I, I have a concern about a couple of things that the CIBC representatives presented. And so I guess my question is, how much will we get to see and approve before this is finalized? I think that, uh, I mean, reading the, reading the motion, seems to me that uh, before an investment were to be made, once when it comes time for the administration to pull the trigger and actually make that investment, uh, that, that a report would come to council and direction would be given to, to do that work. Am I, is, that, is that a correct assumption? Right. The way the policy is drafted, council delegates that authority to the director of finance. Um, in, in theory, they have um, had the opportunity to invest the municipal funds within the previous policy for the last decade or so. So frankly, staff did not anticipate council debating individual investments, individual terms, individual rates of return. We felt that that was a function of your professional staff. Uh, we'll take Council Minaj and then we'll rebuttal then because I heard Sue speak to wanting to take a more conservative approach and the re I don't see the recommendation saying we're going to take the same le less risk approach with CIBC and earn more on our money. I don't see that here. So if this is policy setting, if we're at a policy setting place, then I believe we should be setting policy and not leaving it to staff to wait six months or wait eight weeks or wait some other amount of time when we could set the policy tonight and we could be earning that money that we're not going to be making if we didn't make this, get this portfolio in place tomorrow. Thank you. Councilor Matheson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering what our former uh, Director of Finance, what her views were. She's the one who brought this up. Has, do we have a knowledge of what Kate would have suggested with this program at the moment? CIO? Um, if Kate were here, I would expect that she would be saying approve the agreement to give us the flexibility down the road. I think her personal perspective in terms of the range of funds that might be used might be more liberal or aggressive than the, uh, than the recommendation in front of you at the moment, but we are just being cautious because we don't have that person in the chair today. Having said that, if it's the will of council that we look at the more aggressive components of each of these two entities, and we'll certainly take that under advisement. The policy provides for the range of choices um, 
at the moment. The Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, I am reading this report obviously quite differently than some people. I see this as setting up that um, there is the potential to, to use either company, that um, you know, there'll be um, available funds and, and the range of services will be discussed and considered and then the, the package will come together and, and I'm okay with that. Um, I believe that um, the first paragraph about setting up an agency agreement is specific to one entity because we already have one with the other one. So we didn't have to do that. Is that correct? Um, so, and, and certainly, you know, anybody who's got investments, the last couple months have been pretty volatile. Um, there's been a bit of a rebound in the last three weeks, but um, I'm okay with us um, as we move towards doing something differently that we, we take a, a little step at the, at the beginning and, you know, holding back a little bit of the, the millions of dollars that we have potentially to do that, I'm okay with that. And then as we see how this will all play out and you know, we start to realize some returns and we see, you know, what's coming up in the, in the near future, I fully expect that by the end of our term, we will be um, investing a lot more than $2.5 million with either of these companies because we'll see how it all comes together. I'm not at all... Um, distrustful or, or concerned about the, the hesitancy to, to go aggressive. We've never done this before. So um, I think this is a big step forward. And, you know, I, I would suspect that um, as somebody else perhaps comes into the mix and, you know, we get the, um, the, the things in front of us on the table, I don't personally see my role as a counselor saying, you know, choose this fund over that fund. That's not why I'm sitting here. Um, but I also see that um, I would appreciate getting a report showing what the mix is so that if I had questions, um, I can make those questions. But this is kind of like, you know, when you, um, I guess when you get involved in investments yourself, you make some decisions, but you count on advice um, as well. And so I, I see the report as setting up that we needed an agreement with one of the two firms. This is, is enabling that. And it's saying that we're, we're intending to use both of them, but we're not there yet as to what the mix is. Is that what this report says? CAO. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Mike Myatt. Press the wrong button. I pressed the wrong button. Made an error. Um, I just, uh, I, I, I'll be supporting the recommendation. Um, I distinctly heard the uh, One Investment Program uh, presenters talk about over 100 municipalities, counties having invested in the One Investment Program back a few months ago. And um, I, I I prefer probably as a first time investor uh, two point five million dollars municipal dollars, taking a little bit more of a cautious approach i I like the four hundred thousand dollars over five years in additional funds that uh, potential we'll be taking in in investment returns. I like that number. We can do a whole lot with four hundred thousand dollars over a five year period and uh, the, the the recommendation it, it does state i mean i I'm reading here. Uh, to invest available funds of the municipality through both the one investment program and the extended range of investment services offered by CIBC Wood Gundy. So uh, I, I'm reading it. Um, I'm reading it such that there's there's potential to to invest in both. But taking a little bit of a cautious approach. Um, I, I agree also that that 2.5 million over uh, over a few years time will will probably be higher than that. So I, I, I like the $400,000 over five years. I, I think the 1.1% we're getting right now on investment return in our checking account is, is unacceptable. And uh, I, I, um, I support this recommendation. Yep. Thank you. I think um, I mean, we've had a good discussion on the recommendation. I think that uh, um, you know, we have a lot of money in our possession, the people's money. And I think the discussion that we had um, when these were presented to us, I think highlighted that and highlighted 
um, the need when, when you're entrusted with that kind of money to uh, perhaps behave in a little bit more of a small C conservative uh, uh, way. Big C conservative isn't in anymore, so I'll stick with small C conservative um, approach to uh, um, uh, to handling that money. And more conservative than you might be with your own investment dollars, at least initially while we see our way through. The, we, the financial impact statement in here is shows the potential with a very conservative estimate to quadruple uh, our investment income that we're currently earning, and I think that uh, uh, that is a strong as a strong return on a very conservative uh, estimate. So I think that uh, I will also be supporting the recommendation. But I think uh, we've had a good discussion, so I'm going to call the question. All in favor of the recommendation? Opposed? That's carried. So I just before I move on, I have, I want to give you guys a heads up. Uh, that uh, this evening I had a request uh, from a member to uh, uh, say something uh, during the Good of Council tonight, so I'm going to have the Good of Council session at the end of Committee of the Whole. So I just wanted you all to know that this far in advance. I meant to say it at the beginning, I've just forgotten till this moment. So um, apologies for that, but I wanted to put that on the table. Anyway, that moves on to um, us, us on to Section 5.3 Environmental Services and Transportation, and we have a staff report um, from. Um, the uh, Director of Public Works about the Bruce County Winter Maintenance Agreement. Stuart. Thank you. Um, very briefly, the town again is, um, <clears throat> has, has been uh, given the agreement from Bruce County, a draft agreement is, that's attached to the report here that, that uh, pertains to three specific roads within the municipality for another three-year agreement, very similar to the one that we signed uh, back in 2012. Um, briefly again, Bruce County Road 25, uh, Sogging Bluffs Road, Side Road 1314, there's agreement with each one of those roads to share services. In the last three years, the town has not exchanged money with Bruce County. The agreements flowed through very well and uh, no issues to report. Very good. Then we have a recommendation. Then we'll take questions and comments. The recommendation is that Council considers a bylaw to authorize an agreement for three years with the Corporation of the County of Bruce for the provision of winter maintenance on certain roads within the town of Sogging Shores. Questions or comments to the recommendation. Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Thank you. Um, it's always sort of sad when this comes up because it indicates that winter's coming. So thanks for that, Stuart. Um, the dollar figures attached to the agreement um, will show up during budget, but um, the agreement, are we getting pricing for three years? There's no dollar figures attached to this agreement. Okay, perhaps you could explain that. It's just a shared service agreement. We do some work for them, they do some work for us. As you can see, Soggy and Bluffs Road, it's quite a ways out of our way, quite right adjacent to the Bruce County Road, so they plow that, and we're usually on Bruce Road 25 before they are, so it's just a shared Okay, further questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. That takes us on then to item two, which is a staff report on crosswalk replacement at Albert Street in Southampton, and the uh, Director of Public Works has this one too. Stuart. Thanks again. Um, I'll go through this one a little bit more detail. In 2015, Council approved a budget item to replace the crosswalk at Albert and Clarendon Street with a new intersection pedestrian signal. In response to community requests and as part of the discussion, staff committed to review the placement of the current pedestrian crossover to determine the ideal location for a new installation. Staff at that point contacted a local um, engineer to investigate the placement locations and provide data on the preferred location of the controlled crossing. With many upgrades or changes on the connecting link, the MTO must be consulted and provide approval prior to making any changes. In this case, the town is faced with the following requirements. If the intersection remains at the same location at Clarendon Street, Excuse me. <clears throat> Approval of a new layout is required. However, this process is considered an upgrade and is a minimal requirement. The, we've, can, um, from memory, I think we've done six since I've been here of these just strict upgrades, so they're fairly minimal. Um, if the IPS is moved, is relocated to a different intersection, the M2 would require justification as to why the crossing is being relocated and possibly other requirements, including warrant analysis, to justify its overall need. Town staff have completed traffic and pedestrian counts at both possible locations and provided the data to our consultant for review. Based on the review, the following has been noted. Clarendon Street has marginally higher traffic counts. Lansdowne has slightly higher pedestrian crossing counts. Clarendon Street has slightly higher pedestrian crossing counts going across the highway. And neither site would come anywhere near meeting the technical requirements 
that's been established by the MTO in either the AM, noon, or PM volumes. So very, when I say slightly a marginal, they're very, very close. There's no clear um, front runner there. It's noted that the data is not conclusive and not that any change will be determined on local knowledge and other principles. Other factors that may be contemplated, the proximity to High Street, Clarendon Street is a greater distance from High Street, which is the next con controlled intersection. And at some point, those are parameters we, we can look at is how far those distances are apart for inter controlled intersections. Lansdowne Street currently includes a supervised school crossing for children traveling to the adjacent public school. Driver expectations should be considered and behaviors may be of concern if a change is made to the long-term current location. Approval for relocation may be difficult and is, is not guaranteed, and relocation costs will be higher than a replacement. At this time, staff requires direction from council on what preferred approach will should be pursued by staff for the future placement of the intersection. Thank you. We'll read the recommendation, then we'll take questions or comments. Uh, that the recommendation is that council direct staff to one proceed with the upgrade of the existing crosswalk to an IPS at Albert Street and Clarendon Street in its present location, or two formally request MTO approval for the relocation and upgrade of the crosswalk at Albert Street and Clarendon to an IPS to be located at the Albert Street and Lansdowne Street intersection. Questions or comments? The Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, your report took me by surprise. I didn't realize that there was consideration of, a, of, of another location. So the, the community request comment, um, um, thanks for making us aware of that. The Albert Street, Clarendon Street intersection is where this should happen. Um, it's, it's, you know, we have the same issue in the other direction on the highway in Southampton. Um, and, you know, Morpeth Street is two blocks down. Um, that makes sense. Clarendon Street is two blocks out in the other direction. Um, it's, it's a difficult intersection to get across. There is a crossing guard for kids going to school at Lansdowne. Um, and certainly the improvement that's going on at Morpeth Street right now um, has, is noticeable. Um, it's a very long signal. So when that thing gets pushed, um, you know, the cars are sitting there waiting now until it turns red because it's, it's much more visible. And it, it sets up opportunities for the blocks in both directions um, to get across the road too. So it's, it's serving its purpose for a very wide area. So I would, would be in favor of, of um, number one, which is what we voted for already, which is um, making the um, upgrades at the Albert Street, Clarendon Street, which um, will um, improve that, that location dramatically. I don't think it's it's the right place to move it a block closer to the, the already existing stoplight. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Grace. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, my feeling also is Clarendon. I know that I received a number of and have continued to receive a number of comments from residents who have concerns about the safety of the crossing as it is now at Clarendon. But I wondered, Stu, did you get any resident concerns reported with the Lansdowne crossing? I have not. The, the general comments were is, if we go to do this, that we should investigate where it was. And I just pulled up the capital spreadsheet, um, which is funny, I'm using it, um, <laughs> to note that it was put on the comment that investigation prior to replacement for appropriate location will be completed. So that was a commitment we made to council at the time. So that's the purpose of the report, and comments are, are certainly welcome. Thank you. Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, through you, I agree with Councillor Grace and Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Uh, the Clarendon Albert Street corner is one of the worst corners to try and get through anywhere in, in the municipality. Um, now, my one question for you, Stu, is was the data taken for the Lansdowne crossing taken during school season or summertime? It was based in, um, I have the dates here, but part of it, it was done when the school season started. So we already have a crossing guard there to control the traffic during the school season, and it's very, I imagine it's limited crossing during the summer months where Clarendon is the closest one. It's probably one of the bike, main bike paths through fares from one side of town to the other. So I agree with my other two counterparts that Clarendon should be the main one. Further comments? 
think the most important thing is that we get this thing upgraded to an IPS. I mean, that's that's what makes this safer. These getting rid of these old style crosswalks is key, and going to these IPSs. That's you know we don't need to change location if we make this if we go to this system this better system. So I think that that's uh, I'm glad that we're getting to that and getting started on it. Council Matheson, you had something else. One last comment. Um, knowing what we know now of the when you put it changed over the first one will save a lot of questions and comments throughout the town again like why did it go or they put another stoplight in town so it's uh that'll help thank you all right very good so um so i'm going to reread the recommendation so that it's clear what we're voting on here um that council directs staff to proceed with the upgrade of the existing crosswalk to an IPS at Albert Street and Clarendon Street in its present location. All in favor? That's carried. Okay, uh, that takes us on to communications uh, for and petitions for committee of the whole information. Are there any comments on any of the communications for information? Do you any? Do you have Councillor Grace? Marginally related to the impact 2014 enumeration process report. Um, <clears throat> soon after the start of the term, I asked um, if we could do some kind of a survey regarding our own municipal election and how that went. And uh, I'm wondering what's being done to move forward on that. Ask the clerk if she has comments. Yes, in response, um, there has not been a survey that was presented certainly he did bring it up um, it wasn't taken as a by me as a direction from the uh, committee of whole or council yeah, I mean if there's if you if if you if you have if you have as usual if you have a specific recommendation or something you'd like to see carried forward <coughs> pardon me bring it forward in a notice of motion and uh, we can move it forward that way okay uh, uh, vice deputy mayor huber i just want to make, is uh, is there any other comment about that particular issue um we have some bars or minutes there i just um would want to take advantage of the fact that um, the director of public works is here we've had about three weeks now of garbage collection with basra um have, have you got any kind of comment about how that's going thank you um so yeah, we've been receiving daily and weekly reports on, on calls that they've been getting. And for the most part, the first week, maybe three to four calls a day, mostly based on just pickup times. Um, the, the main concern was that we had a truck with, with folks on the back picking up both sides. They have a truck that would pick up one side and then the next. And folks would be concerned in that 10 minute gap that they were missed. So that, that worked itself out. And for the most part, very limited calls that we've been that's good to hear. Further, uh, anything further on the uh, petitions for information? No. Um, then we also have uh, three reports of department heads, um, an information report uh, with regard to the financial review, revenue expenses to September 30th. Uh, does the deputy treasurer have any comments to that uh, to that um, report? Not at this time. Okay. Um, are there any comments or questions to that report from members of the committee? The uh, councillor, Mike Myatt. Just one comment about the financial report, and I just wanted to thank uh, Susan for preparing a, a, you know, a detailed report for council to take a look at. And I, I remember uh, sitting in a meeting here uh, just about a year ago, I think, and um, our treasurer um, you know, presented a report uh, indicating that we we're probably going to be looking at $500,000 in arrears by year end. Uh, I think it was around the same time that that report was presented last October, and I don't uh, see uh, anywhere near to that kind of that kind of uh, bleak news. So I, I know we're down. It looks as though our building permits are down. We'll be having to dip into some reserves. But uh, I, I guess, Larry, the um, question through to you, to our CEO. Um, we're, it appears to me we're in a better financial condition than we were uh, in last year's report. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, we are. Um, I think last year we were indicating that we may have to use some SUP assessment revenue to offset some over expenditures, which in fact we ended up doing in fiscal 2014. 
Uh, this year, uh, no, we aren't in that position at all. So, uh, but this is um, reasonably good news in terms of uh, what's happening. Uh, we'll start with Councillor, um, um, you know, Neil Minaj, Councillor Minaj. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, Luke. And I, w I would. So, so my issue with this is that we received another report on the operating budget in June that red flagged a number of areas. There was some serious concerns with staff wages in certain areas. Now, I'm, I'm. It would be reasonable to to suggest and think that they straighten themselves out. But that's not what I'd like to see, what, and, and, I, and I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that's what we would like to hear. What I'd like to see is, is, uh, is a follow-up report that, that reflects that, that, that says, here's, here's the operating one that we flagged in June, and, and here's the areas where we were minus 25 to the bad, and, and here's what it is today. And, and we don't have that, so we're floundering a little with words that say, um, <clears throat> there are no significant changes in the forecast for these areas from the previous report. So to me, it says that if there are no significant changes in the forecast for these areas from the previous report, then we have a real problem still on, on the pool coming to year end. So I'd like to see, I'm sure that's not the case. So I'd, I'd like to see the, the wording change or the information change so that what we were given in June does, doesn't get lost in some words here and then become a monumental surprise when we see the, see the final numbers coming through in, in November, December. Thank you. I think these reports, these uh, quarterly reports, are a bit of a mixed bag. They, they show us a snapshot in time over the course of implementation of a 12-month of a budget. I think the best time to assess each department and its effectiveness uh, over the course of a year is during the budget when we see the when we see the final or at least the the best final draft of the of the finances that can be generated so I think uh, um, it's important that we get these updates uh, I think but it's uh, but it, uh, but it, they have to be taken in the context of what they are and and they're certainly it's a mo it's a moving target in June it's a moving target in September as to where we're at in budget implementation and where things are going to end up at the end um, just my comment to that. Uh, Councillor Grace. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor, I guess through you to um, the CAO. Um, the report indicated that building bylaw enforcement and planning revenues are below target and prior year to date levels. Um, sir, do you have any sense of why is this a trend? The CAO. I, I think staff are monitoring that quite closely. Um, I, I frankly don't know about trending information amongst Bruce County municipalities on, on a broader basis. I, I know we're, we're generally the fastest growing and the most active uh, of all the municipalities in the lower tier in the, in the county. Uh, I think that there are a number of lots that are um, reaching final stages of um, coming onto the market so we don't have any new applications that, that would typically create the planning revenues. And I think there's a lot of people that are waiting for the Bruce Power refurbishing news to come and that will kind of right the ship in terms of what's happening over the longer term. And uh, we've been waiting for that announcement as most of the community has for a number of months. Nothing further on that report. Oh, count, uh, pardon me, Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to comment, and I, I probably heard this before and I have just had forgotten. Um, it's interesting to see that um, the students from the high school are helping us out again um, with building the dugouts for Beener Park, and, and so I um, just wanted to make sure that that was flagged as, as a, a nice partnership that, you know, it seems once a year we're able to, to work together on, on something. I got excited though when I saw that the actual total cost of the project was only $80, but I think that's just to date, right? Because <laughs> uh, that sounded like a really good deal. Um, but um, certainly um, look forward to seeing the results of that, that partnership again. Thank you. Very good. That's also a great partnership with our, uh, with our ball leagues in town too. So another great cooperative uh, venture that we have going on. 
If, with that, I'll take us on to the next one, information report on trail usage statistics. Uh, fortunately, the Director of uh, Community Services isn't with us, but we, uh, I requested this information be presented when the rail trail uh, was here, and so it's uh, there for your information. Uh, and um, are there any comments on any of that? Uh, uh, Councilor Grace? Uh, yes, this is a really helpful report, and um, I just wondered, I'm assuming it's then shared with the rail trail? I, yes. Thank yes. you. Nothing further on that one. Uh, there's the final one here, also the information report on tenant space at the Southampton Town Hall. Um, are there comments on that one? Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Um, the Director of Community Services is in here. I just wanted to, to note um, that um, the Heritage Committee um, will have an interest in this building. It's a designated building, so um, the report doesn't reflect that the Heritage Committee will um, be making some comments about um, any any um, changes to the signage there. And, and I look forward to this being a real improvement to the building. So this is an exciting report, and um, certainly um, it's an iconic structure in Southampton. And, and this is this is a very good news project. Thank you. Anything further? None that takes us to the end of the uh, agenda, but we're going to do the further go to council tonight. So uh, um, we'll start, uh, I'll put them on the hot seat, and we'll start with uh, Councillor Mike Myatt. Oh, I did, oh, I did uh, two little things. Okay. And I, I just want to congratulate uh, Councillor Dave Myatt. He, uh, he had the, the highest volume of air of uh, all of the councillors around the table at the Pumpkin, Pumpkin Fest seed spitting contest. So I just want to thank you and congratulate you, Dave. For a well, job well done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. A little taller. Um, two weeks ago, I just wanted to mention to council. I did attend a, a one-day physician recruitment um, day down at. Uh, it was hosted by the University of Toronto, and uh, I just wanted to say, our physician recru recruiter uh, Peggy did a wonderful job that day. I was down to her sister and. I, at one point, I said, why do, you, why do you need assistance? But I, I, I found out pretty quickly. There's 300, 300 delegates uh, at that physician recruitment day uh, that day, and they were all in their first and second final year um, heading out to practice uh, medicine. And uh, we had, uh, I think, probably 150-plus, maybe more, come to our table. And uh, I, uh, I just wanted to say that listening to those young doctors that came to our table, I, I want to say that we're, if it gives any indication that they were, we're, we're in good hands, and uh, we, uh, we, got, we got some leads. I, I sat in one of the sessions, it was interesting, um, the presenter up at the front, uh, by a show of hands, asked the, the uh, young doctors in the, in the audience, um, saying how many uh, would be planning to um, set up new practice um, this coming year? Uh, as you finish your uh, your, your uh, education, and uh, how many setting up new practice versus doing locum work, and you know there was two sessions, 150 in each room, but in that one room, with 150 young doctors sitting in, in there, there was uh, two hands went up that they would be setting up their own uh, practice in the, in the in the next year to come, and the balance uh, would, would be doing some locum work, uh, and I and I and I bring that to council's attention because I just. You know, I sometimes think we, uh, you know, we, we wonder why, uh, you know, it, it, it's so difficult to, you know, to attract doctors into our community. And, um, you know, that just gives us, uh, you know, for setting up family practice. And uh, it gives you an idea, though, that uh, what they're thinking is they've got, they've got some pretty high, high-end, uh, you know, university school costs, medicine, you know, costs coming out of school. And... I think just getting their feet in the ground sometimes is doing some locum work is the right thing to do. But I just wanted to mention that to Council because I thought it was an interesting point, uh, observation that I made in one of the sessions where just, you know, two would be setting up, you know, practice in the next year or so. Um, but I just wanted to say um, your physician recruiter is working very hard. I think she's doing an excellent job, and uh, we, 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 got, we got a couple leads, I think. So, thank you. Good. Uh, thanks, Mike. Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's aware, but this coming Friday, Easter Seals will be hosting their first 
ever NHL All-Star Hockey Tournament in Sogging Shores. There are eight teams uh, participating, and all monies raised from that will be going towards Easter Seals House in London. And if you have nothing better to do, come out at 1 o'clock or 4 o'clock, and you can watch Councillor Rich and myself try to uh, look after ourselves on the ice with some of the local teams and NHL All-Stars. And if you haven't already, pledges can be made at easterseals.ca. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Don. Uh, Councillor Rich. Um, I wasn't uh, really prepared for, good, for the good of council, but since um, um, Councillor Mayette um, mentioned doctor recruitment, in a regular council there's going to be uh, um, some information about Dr. Julie Gibb, who we happened to have over for dinner the other night. And she is a uh, wonderful person. Um, her parents are moving to town from Sudbury and her husband. So her entire family is moving here. And I think that that's a good news story for us. Um, I know that there have been some positions that have left in the past. But uh, when her parents are moving to town, I think that's a pretty good sign. Anyway. Thank you, John. Uh, Councillor Dave Myatt. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm not going to report on a whole lot, but I, I, I thought I'd take this opportunity to acknowledge some of the good things that's happening in our community with our emergency service personnel. Uh, the, uh, the fire department, on one hand, uh, has just recently acquired a antique fire truck that apparently used to belong to the municipality at uh, one point in time and was sold. It has been reacquired. It's a 1939, I believe, uh, Fargo truck that they're in the process of restoring so the volunteers in the fire department are busy polishing so if you get a chance go by the fire hall and see this uh, truck that uh, that Captain Steingart and uh, some of his crew are busily working on polishing and rechroming and the other thing I wanted to add was the police department have had a couple of particularly busy months uh, they've uh, I don't know if everybody gets the police reports I know the media gets <coughs> gets the monthly reports and uh, of note was on September the 30th where the police were called to a an emergency situation in the Arlington apartments in town where there was a smoke alarm sounding and uh, and they uh, they actually risked risked their life and limb and uh, kicked in the door of this apartment that uh, had smoke emanating from it and were able to enter the building the apartment and uh, extinguish a fire before the fire department arrived, searched the building and actually extracted a woman who was unconscious from smoke inhalation and uh, and that they, they saved their lives. And, and being that uh, I've been so busy with the situation in Owen Sound and the United Way response to the fires over there, I, I, it really resounded with me that they were able to do this in a, an apartment building setting and they prevented a what could have been a much greater catastrophe and much greater loss of life. So accolades to our police and uh, emergency service personnel. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Councillor Grace. Um, hi, thank you. Um, yes, uh, last Wednesday, um, Stephen Harris, who is on the Economic Development Committee with me and, uh, and I, went over to a workshop in uh, Collingwood, uh, which was on performance measurement. In other words, you know, how do you tell if your economic development strategies are working? and what you need to readjust. And uh, it was a great workshop put on by um, uh, Cheryl Brine, who's done, uh, just recently did a presentation for the Economic Development Committee. Uh, she's with the um, Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. Um, and um, it was a, an excellent workshop. It was also attended by Joanne Robbins of the Chamber and Patrick Chicknita of the Business Enterprise Center. And, and uh, Sogging Shores was well represented. It was very valuable. And, um, and our, our economic development committee is really steaming along. So I thought um, that's good news, too. Thanks. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Councillor Minaj. Appreciate the opportunity. I wasn't going to say something or anything, but um, the whole fire fire department and the fire thing has uh, resonated with me and, and, and happened to me. In the past two weeks, the, uh, my uh, carbon monoxide alarm went off at 2.45 a.m. in the morning, approximately, and, uh, which is a horrible time. And I'm sitting there going, now what? We were all okay, and uh, it clearly requires a 911 call that I didn't want to make, that we have to make. And, and Phil supports that, our fire chief. So I, my wife said to me, 
well, we, what are we going to do? We either got to leave the house or how are we going to go back to, to sleep? It was, it, it was off. We didn't know whether we had carbon monoxide or not. So we called 911 and the fire department responded quite promptly and did a complete survey of our home and uh, found that our, our uh, detector was okay and that there was no carbon monoxide in the home. So there's a theory that Phil has, and I think that we would we should ask for him to provide a report. And uh, the theory is that this isn't a single occurrence. There are multiple occurrences happening, and I didn't I didn't want to blame our our uh, national friends, the Chinese, for putting something in the chip that says that they should all fail at 2:45 in the morning. But there is a there's an obvious problem that's arising. They said it was a weak, it, it, it the detector was weak. They thought it was voltage, and that at some point during the during the night, the whole community is experiencing some, experiencing a voltage drop, and that there we, there has been many occurring almost at the same time. So the department is we need to we we may need to ask for a report if if this is conclusive, that uh, we may have a, a voltage problem in the community, and it and if you have a weak detector. It is going to go off. Anyway, the end of the story is if your detector goes off, you should call 911. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Thank you. Um, we also um, had an issue with a, a carbon monoxide smoke detector, and, and the fire prevention officer, Jeff, um, is very good at coming out and testing your equipment, so good message. Um, a couple of things. Very soon, um, I hope, uh, there will be some information coming to Council um, about some potential updates um, and, and amendments and changes to the zoning bylaw. We will have a, the Planning Advisory Committee will, will be having a, a special meeting coming up because we, we've got a couple of um, topics that are worthy, I, I guess, of a, of a special meeting. So I'll make sure via Linda um, that the date gets out to everybody. I would encourage all of you, um, if you're able, to, to just come and sit in the audience um, because eventually all this stuff will be before us here. And um, I think it would be um, interesting uh, for all of us to sort of have the chance to have as much time as we've had with planning to get around our heads around some of the ideas. So um, certainly um, you're very welcome to come to any meeting of the Planning Advisory Committee. But I would suggest be, there's a special meeting coming up soon that will be specific to some information um, about uh, potential changes to the zoning bylaw. Um, Councillor Grace mentioned about the Economic Development Committee steaming along. Um, I'm also, along with Councillor Matheson, sitting on one of the new committees, which is the Recreation and Active Transportation Committee, which I call REACT. Um, some people were abbreviating it to RAT, but uh, REACT sounds a little more positive. Our committee's been working too, and um, you know, hopefully in the next little while you're going to see some information about a potential recreation master plan. So we've got some, some stuff happening there. We're steaming along too. Um, the other committee I sit on is, is the Heritage Committee, and I'll just mention that both the mayor and I were at the Bruce County Historical Society meeting on Saturday which was held at the town hall in Southampton. And it's just a wonderful thing when you walk into the town hall and it's full of people. Um, I don't know how many people were there, but um, it was a really great turnout. And one of the messages that I guess um, hopefully will float through a number of activities by economic development and tourism and whatever, that heritage makes a difference and heritage matters. All you have to do is look at the Walker House in Southampton to just see how a little bit of attention to the history of a particular location or a particular industry or activity can really pay off in a, in a very positive vibe. And so, um, you know, certainly um, I know that... Uh, the mayor, um, he, he actually spoke um, briefly at the meeting, but it was uh, there's a lot of interest in heritage, and hopefully we'll have a chance to do a few things over the, the this term of council that recognize some activity like what's going on at the Walker House. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, I, I have two things. One thing, uh, on Friday I participated uh, with uh, the senior management uh, team here and, uh, and ma senior management across the county of Bruce in an emergency uh, uh, simulation uh, it was titled the apocalypse and uh, uh, it didn't quite feel like the apocalypse but it was uh, but it was good I, I really just wanted to advise council that that uh, that happened and uh, that uh, um, 
there's, you know, I've, as with all these things, there's lots of things you work through and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, administrations across the county are working through uh, different scenarios and figuring out how well to how best to respond to an emergency should one arise and uh, and actively working on that and uh, and doing a good job of it and I think uh, it's important to acknowledge that and that the community knows that that's going on and that uh, that um, in case of an emergency in case something uh, uh, catastrophic happens heaven forbid in our community we do have uh, um, a plan and we're, and we're working on how to deal with that uh, on an ongoing basis and uh, um, it gives me some comfort, and I hope it gives you all some comfort as well. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, tomorrow is the 27th of October, and uh, you, I, I know I don't know if all you remember where you were on the 27th of October, 2014, but I know where I was. And uh, um, it's one year of this uh, council term is uh, complete as of tomorrow, and I just uh, um, wanted to uh, congratulate council on uh, that milestone, and uh, looking forward to uh, three more years of uh, excitement around this table. So uh, well done to all of you for uh, for uh, for that. So with that, uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Matheson, seconded by Councillor Dave Mayette. We'll reconvene at 9 p.m. <laughs>